Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome here to Toronto Western Hospital. Um, it is such a pleasure to see all of you here today. My name is Lisa Jerome. I'm the VP of Marketing Communications and Community Giving at Toronto General and Western Hospital Foundation. And uh, I have to say this is an incredible turnout we've had today. We've had a waiting list to actually get in here. Uh, so I think this is our best turnout ever. So all of you should feel really privileged that you made it in here sooner than everyone else. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, partly the reason why there's been such a demand is for this amazing topic that we have here today. Um, and what we try to do with our behind the scenes lectures is provide you, our, our very generous and loyal donors, with the opportunity to meet some of the stars and the experts and that we have here. And really we're doing groundbreaking work and a lot of people really don't understand it and know about what we do. So, you know, we like to provide this access to you and provide you the opportunity to have this intimate experience where you can hear from our stars and ask questions, etc. So what we're going to do is have uh, a presentation um, from our guest speakers today and we will have some time afterwards to do some question and answer. So uh, think about your questions that you might want to ask after because there's going to be some really great information you're going to hear today too. So the topic today is the latest breakthroughs and innovations in our arthritis. And just to give you a little bit of pro, uh, information about our arthritis program here at Toronto Western Hospital, we have four areas of specialty. So orthopedics, rheumatology, our hand program, and osteoporosis. It is the largest program in Canada, and uh, we have over 80,000 patients per year coming through. And as an example, we've done 4,000 joint replacements in a year. So it shows you the type of volume that comes through. So obviously with that volume comes great expertise and you're going to hear from two great people today. So uh, it is one of the best and the largest rheumatology programs in North America as well. And in 2016, it was home to Canada's first hand transplant. So that's pretty incredible that we can do this here. So uh, let me just introduce our two speakers for today and they're going to come up. Um, I'm sure you all heard about this event through our donor newsletter, Report on Your Support. And um, I hope you've all read it because our two speakers are featured in this uh, uh, version and we do have some on the way out if you'd like to uh, grab a few extras or pass them on to friends, etc. So let me just first introduce uh, our speakers. The first is Dr. Mohit Kapoor. He is a card uh, cartilage biologist. He joined the Buchan Arthritis Research Center here at Kremel Research Institute in 2014. He's the research director of our arthritis program at the Research Institute. He's also an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at U of T and his lab focuses on the causes of osteoarthritis, specifically why does cartilage break down and he'll talk a little bit about this today. Uh, he's also investiga investigating origins of diseases such as scleroderma and in 2014 he was part of a team that discovered tissue biomarkers that contribute to the cause of spinal arthritis. And our second speaker is Dr. Raj Ramprasad. He is a spine surgeon here at Toronto Western and he is renowned and specializes in minimally invasive surgery. He's uh, also an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto and he joined UHN here in 1999. He's co-director of the Arthritis Centre for Health Transformation and his research is focusing on the evaluation and the outcome of safety and spine and orthopedic surgery. So very specialized and very interesting. Uh, he's also assessing and developing mechanisms to improve the delivery of care for Canadians that suffer from arthritis and spine, uh, arthritis of the spine and joints. So I'm going to ask them both to come up now and uh, after their presentation we can ask them some questions. So thank you and welcome. Well, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to be honest, uh, I think uh, waiting list has to be for us. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here, to be able to really share the innovations and the research work which we are doing. And to be honest, I'm actually overwhelmed that I'm invited to be able to speak in front of you guys. So thank you all for coming. Uh, one of our latest breakthroughs in research, what we are actually doing within our um, um, uh, institute. Uh, to be honest, our team does not only comprise of me or Dr. Ram Prasad, it's, it's a team of scientists and clinicians who are working endless hours to be able to find latest breakthroughs as well as ways to be able to cure and uh, find ways to find new models of care where we can bring right kind of therapy for right kind of patients. So this is not just, this is just a glance of just two of people who are part of a very big program. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, what our motivation is. I'm sure you're all here, so I know your motivation why you're here, but I think it's really important for me to tell you why we are working in the field of arthritis and we, why we want to combat this debilitating disease. If you look at the health costs associated with uh, arthritis, you're looking at almost 33 billion annual costs which are associated in Canada alone. And this number is actually going to double up in the next 15 to 20 years. If you look at the number of uh, patients or the, uh, num um, the age which actually affects uh, uh, patients with arthritis, you're not, uh, it's not a disease of just elderly patient, uh, uh, people, but also uh, people who actually are uh, younger population as well. If you look at the number of people affected by arthritis, it's almost around 4.6 million people affected by arthritis, and this number is actually going to double in the next 15 to 20 years, and that's a massive amount. If you look at the leading causing of, uh, causes of disability in women, arthritis is number one cause of disability. In men, it's the third most prevalent cause of disability, not only in Canada, but worldwide. If you look at Every minute we have a new diagnosis of arthritis, but specifically one kind of arthritis, which is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is the most common form of disability, not only in Canada, but worldwide. The problem we have, especially in osteoarthritic field, is we do not have a single drug in market, whether approved by Health Canada, FDA, or around the world, which can stop the disease process. Almost every single drug which is out in the market is just to be able to provide pain relief. We do not have a single test around the world which can, disease the, which can detect the disease at very early stages of the disease so that we can intervene early on. And there's a huge gap in the, uh, in the field of uh, osteoarthritis. Therefore, we want to actually touch base on our goals, what we have, what we are implementing within the Toronto Western and University Health Network to be able to combat this disease. Our strategy is to be able to have no more waiting, to be able to implement new models of care through what uh, Dr. Ramprasad is going to touch base on the uh, strategies which they are uh, using to be able to create new models of care through their Center for Health Transformation. We also do not want to have a guessing game. We want to be able to come up with these identification diagnostic tests to be able to detect if you have osteoarthritis or not, what stage of osteoarthritis you have, and ways to be able to intervene early on. And the ways to intervene early on comes through our third strategy is no more osteoarthritis to be able to share with you the injectable therapies we are currently working on, which has happened because of the donation and the support which you have provided. And we were able to make these uh, groundbreaking discoveries in the last three to four years, which have helped us in creating three complementary injectable therapies, which I'm going to touch base in a second. Ultimately, we want no more pain for our patients, but also to be able to stop the disease in its ranks before it actually progresses, before you have to get joint replacement as a last resort. Now, it's very important, I'm a scientist, so I have to show you the joints, and it's important for uh, me to tell you why osteoarthritis uh, starts. And, you know, I'm different than you, you're different than the other person, and we all actually develop osteoarthritis in a different manner. There are a subset of patients who would have some kind of a risk factor, whether it's age-related, whether it's because of your genetic makeup, 
or there is something which is in your bloods or joints which you're carrying, which are different from other patients. We all have some specific characteristic why we start getting osteoarthritis. If I actually point out on this particular uh, figure, this is a, a joint which has this number one area denotes to a bone area, but number two is the cartilage. This cartilage is almost essential for maintaining your healthy joints. When any degeneration of cartilage or destruction of cartilage starts, there can be ways where destruction of cartilage can be accelerated. And you can be in this situation where your cartilage is depleting and ultimately you're bone on bone where you only have to get joint replacement. Our strategy is to be able to find why your cartilage actually starts to degenerate. To be able to identify those early events which actually can be detected by a simple blood test. And then at that time to be able to intervene to stop the disease process in a very early stages. So that's why I'm going to first talk about our uh, specific strategies which we have put in place based on our discoveries. Currently, we are working on three specific injectable therapies. These injectable therapies are targeting molecules, genes, and cells. And somebody would ask me, why three complementary therapies? Like I said before, we all have different genetic makeup. We produce almost same kind of molecules in our body but some molecules we produce in our body are different than the others. Somebody could have same genes in our body, but there could be a mutation of a one particular gene in one person, but that may not happen in the other. That's why you need to find different strategies to be able to combat uh, osteoarthritis. And I'm gonna talk about molecules, genes, and cells. Our body is made up of tissues. Our tissues are made up of cells. And these cells produce lots of different molecules and factors in our body. So for us, we had to really understand what our body is made up of in a normal state and what happens when a patients get osteoarthritis. And in 2016, we discovered a pair of tissue markers. What we did was we looked at the entire production of molecules in our body in a human if you are looking at a uh, number of molecules we produced, these are thousands of molecules. But we identified there were two specific molecules in your body which actually starts to increase, their production start to increase when you start to get degeneration of the cartilage. And what was really interesting was, as the degeneration of cartilage increases, you also started to get more and more increased levels of these uh, uh, markers. And which was really important, uh, it was a really lucky breakthrough because out of thousands of molecules we are looking at, we were able to just identify just two molecules which were associated with this phenomenon. And, uh, you know, taking this work further, and I think it's very important for me to tell you what these molecules actually mean and what this molecular therapy would actually, what will actually do. In your spine, you have a very important joint which is called facet joint. This facet joint has a cartilage. Now, when the degeneration of uh, facet cartilage takes place, there is a production of a particular um, uh, factor called microRNA. This is a molecule which we identified out of thousands of molecules we were looking at. What this molecule actually does is, once it's produced in the cartilage, it is actually shed out, thrown out from the cartilage into your uh, joint fluid, which is called synovial fluid, but is also is sent into the blood. But what this factor then does is it starts to then destroy the cartilage in an accelerated fashion. Now, if patients are presenting these molecules at very early stages of the disease, those are the likely candidates to be able to get accelerated degeneration of their cartilage. Now, the strategy we took at that time was how do we intercept during early stage so that we can stop the production of these uh, harmful molecules. So we started exploring how we can stop the inflammation and cartilage uh, destruction uh, from these uh, molecules. And we started creating some uh, screening of uh, blockers against these uh, molecules. And this was a big process because we didn't know how we could actually really block these molecules, but we now have 
a good blocker which we have now tested and we can say that this blocker when you inject this molecular blocker into the joints whether it's in the spine or knee osteoarthritis it actually goes into the joints and blocks these, um, uh, the activity of these uh, molecules from destroying the cartilage. And in that way, you can actually decrease the inflammation and cartilage uh, destruction. And I'll show you what, uh, what this, uh, um, this means in, a, in, in an actual joint. When I actually show you the left side, and when you see the red or pinkish color, that means the cartilage is healthy this which is on the right hand side. On the left side, this uh, red pinkish color is lost, that means your cartilage is depleted. Now, when you inject this molecular blocker, you're able to stop the cartilage destruction. That is uh, uh, in the spine osteoarthritis, but this phenomena is also conserved in knee osteoarthritis as well. If somebody who has knee osteoarthritis, your, your, your uh, joints look like this, where you have loss of that red color, that means loss of the cartilage. When you inject this molecular therapy, you are able to stop the cartilage degeneration um, uh, from uh, propagating further. That's why this kind of therapy is so critical for patients who actually would be presenting uh, high levels of these molecules at very early stages of the disease. And these are the kind of patients who would actually get this kind of molecular therapy. We are hoping that uh, we are able to bring this kind of therapy in the next three to five years uh, for our patients. And right now we, are, we have uh, done our preclinical studies. That means we identified these uh, molecular markers in our patients and then we went back in animal studies. We've tested these animal blockers and we found great promise for these blockers to be able to stop uh, osteoarthritis and we are right now doing some safety studies to be able to bring these to uh, clinics for our patients in the next three to five years. The next strategy we have is uh, to be able to use a gene therapy. The gene therapy stems out from a work which we did in 2013 and we identified a particular gene which is lost in the cartilage as we age. This gene is present when we are young but even in the younger population, if we have any joint injury, this gene is lost. So if this gene is actually present, and you can see from this, this is a healthy cartilage, you actually have the red color or pinkish color, which means that you have healthy cartilage. But when this gene is lost, you are almost bone on bone. That means there is a rapid acceleration of uh, cartilage uh, destruction. So we started to uh, use some strategies how we can actually introduce this gene into the cartilage. And we went through this process for almost three years and uh, we found a way where we can actually take the gene and put back into the joint and to be able to rejuvenate the cartilage. And this is the evidence what we have is when you do not have the gene, you have the rapid destruction of the cartilage. But when you're able to introduce the gene into the cartilage, you're able to protect it. And this is a kind of therapy which would be applicable to those kind of patients who are seeing rapid loss of this particular gene. And this is a therapy which won't be applicable to patients who are actually showing the elevated levels of the molecules which I showed to you, but only specifically for those patients who actually do not have this gene. The third therapy we are working on is the cell therapy. Um, uh, this is to be able to regenerate and restore cartilage. And it's really uh, important uh, for us to mention that we were the first uh, center to initiate the first clinical trial for mesenchymal uh, cells. And uh, right now we have completed this trial and we are hoping to get the entire results and the outcome of this um, uh, data from this trial by end of 2017. We are hoping moving forward that we're gonna be initiating an allogeneic trial because in an initial trial, uh, we have, it was called an autologous trial. That means your cells are going into your body. But the next trial is going to be an allogeneic trial, which is going to be a healthy donor cells are going into a patient's cell. So somebody else's cell, you're getting into somebody else's body. But healthy, going into a patient who has osteoarthritis. We're hoping to initiate uh, allogeneic trial in 2018. 
But once you have all these strategies, cell therapy, molecular therapy, as well as gene therapy, it's also important for us to identify our patients, to be able to identify who would get the gene therapy, who would get the molecular therapy, or who will get uh, a, a cellular therapy. And for that, we don't want to have any guessing game, and uh, we want to have a diagnostic test to be able to really detect patients in early stages of the disease to be able to really identify what stage of the disease you are at and also to be able to intervene early on. Currently, we are working on three specific um, uh, uh, blood test panels which are associated with various forms of osteoarthritic disease. That means if you are in a category of overweight or normal weight, you actually would be carrying different molecules in your blood. So you would be able to tell what kind of molecular therapy you would need. Similarly, you would be able to do the genetic testing to be able to tell if you are losing this gene and you would keep, get the gene therapy and similarly for the cell therapy as well. So this is all what I have to say from No More Guessing and from No More uh, Osteoarthritis. Moving forward, uh, I want to uh, invite uh, Dr. Ramprasad to be able to talk from the lab to the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohit. Um, I must spend a moment again to also thank all of you for coming and spending a little bit of time with us. Hopefully you find this very informative, but I also must be humbled by Dr. Mohit's uh, humility because he's accomplished all of this in three years, which is unheard of. So this has really been a, a spectacular addition to our program, and as he said, this is all about a program. We're very much uh, not quite interchangeable. He's a cell engineer, and I'm more of a system engineer, so we have different, different aspects of research, but it all comes together, hopefully, to make life better for, hopefully, this generation, and certainly for the future ones. Um, so Mohit has been brilliant, and he didn't pay me to say that, but I will <laughs> get a fee from him at some point. So, but the reason that I'm here is the brilliance of somebody like Mohit um, is, used, is wasted if the right patient doesn't find out about this therapy and we can't find that person early enough. By the time you see me, you're kind of done. <laughs> like you're, you're sort of at the end of the rope, you're seeing a surgeon, that means whatever's happened is, is gone beyond what uh, this gentleman and others like him can actually do to change whatever is happening. So that's our goal, is to go as upstream as possible, but how do you do that in a healthcare system that is all about waiting? It's just the nature of our system. So it's, these are the parts of the puzzle that all need to be fit together, and that's why you need a team. If he just did this in isolation in the lab, it probably wouldn't go anywhere. And if I just tried to change the system without better treatments, then I'm just putting you through a different door, but there's nothing at the end of that doorway it doesn't really help you. So it's about trying to find the right alignment and get the right things um, for the right people. So the more practical things about arthritis that you may not know is it actually, if you have arthritis, independent of having heart disease, all these other things that kill us, so does arthritis, because your lack of mobility affects all these other things. So independent, if, you're, if your mobility is affected, your life expectancy is actually shorter. Right? So it's not something we, we just say go live with it, but in fact it, it can kill you because of that secondary effect, and that's been shown. Because of that, it increases your risk of heart disease, and it is probably short of Alzheimer's or brain neurodegeneration, the other commonest reason to end up in a nursing home or uh, non-dependent or dependent living. So it's, these are big impacts on individuals that change their lives and those of their caregivers. So these are things that we don't talk too much about arthritis. Yes, it's associated with pain, but it does some other really bad stuff that we, we need to talk about some more. And many of you have probably had this experience in our healthcare system. So let's take somebody with back pain, because that's my sort of area of specialty. In a six month period, once as you start having a sore back, you'll have gone to multiple eMERGE, seen a bunch of different people, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So tell me if I'm wrong, and this was not your experience in our system. But that's that's a challenge, and it's just the way it goes. And then you see six different people, and you get seven different opinions as to what it is is wrong with you and what you need to do. So the system is extremely fragmented, and it just doesn't 
ultimately lead to confidence for uh, those who are in it. So the system's kind of built around me. It's not actually built around you, if you think about it. It's very provider-centric, and you tend to have to bounce back and forth between the different providers to hopefully get the right care in the end, but sometimes you don't, or you keep getting the wrong care, and things as things progress, you may miss the opportunity of getting an early injection or other things. So it's just the way the system is designed, we're trying to take that and turn it around and truly make it patient-centric, which obviously makes sense. Because a lot of these transitions back and forth, you know, hopefully you don't need surgery, but some people need surgery and they probably needed it three years ago before I saw them, not at this point where things have potentially gone so far that surgery doesn't even help. So it becomes a problem of the system. So with this, as we know, any, any arthritis sufferers in here? That's a leading question. <laughs> um, comes pain, and what comes with pain? Social isolation, mood changes, frustration, depression, anxiety, like you, you're like you need help. And so that's one thing we also don't talk about a lot, but all of our studies have shown at least half of folks who have arthritic pain have milder forms, sometimes more significant forms of mood alteration, depression, anxiety, sleep disturbance, all the things that also then just make your pain worse. So it's not just about your sore knee or your sore back, it's how it affects you as a person. You stop saying, you're going to go do this or you're going to go do that, so you start to get more socially isolated, so it starts to impact all these other things. And your family physician or whoever is, is trying to deal with all these things, your pain is not getting better, the system has all these barriers, so they're also frustrated. So it doesn't really end up in ideal care. Resonate so far? Does this sound <laughs> familiar? Yeah, I don't usually have a hard time selling this story. <laughs> Um, and we've done focus groups, et cetera, to understand it because my perspective is one small perspective. So we've had chats with patients and we've tried to build a system or rebuild a system from, from the ground up. If we look at the volumes, it's just huge. You know, at least uh, um, you know, three million people, about a third of the population is seeking care for a sore something, whether it's a knee, a hip, a back. And about 25% of them have ongoing pain. Um, and basically continue to make ongoing visits. So there's about you know, a million people a year that we're not really treating properly because their pain is persistent. They just keep coming back and forth to their, their provider. And this is where we're trying to change. So when we say <laughs> we're aiming for more help, hands up how, how many people feel this way sometimes in, their, in, in the waiting area, right? You know, yeah, five more minutes. And, 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 and often it feels like, well, they're overbooking the clinic. And that, unfortunately, may be true for some, but a lot of times, for me to actually sit there and have a meaningful conversation with you ends up in some people taking 30 minutes and others it's two minutes. And so the wait times, all these things that you experience are sometimes good, but sometimes they're bad, and it's just a system issue. Um, so the normal waiting uh, is really been driven through what we call an interprofessional spine assessment education clinic. So this was built on a proof of concept. It was actually funded through philanthropic support from many in the room and, and those to come. But to basically look at how can we make this truly a patient-centric system. This was for back pain, but now we basically have shown the Ministry of Health a proof of concept that they're building out other models like this for hips, for knees, for shoulders. So we really are changing the system, which is what we're excited about. But it essentially integrates primary care, physios and chiros for the back, physios for other joints, and specialists like myself to form a shared care network. So we are now the care envelope around you. And some people only need one, one provider, other needs all three. And then, but you want those providers to be all coordinated so that you're getting the right care at the right time by the right person. And if you're in Thunder Bay or Windsor, you're going to hear the same advice and it's going to be consistent and in your best interest rather than you need more therapy or you need this or you need that because at the end of the day, pain's also business. There's a lot of folks out there who make a lot of money on sore joints and sore pain and it's not that they're, it's inappropriate, but if it's not working, you should be moved on to the next part of the process. You need further benefit rather than keep doing the same thing or paying for the same thing that doesn't work. So the, the system drives some of it. So we basically have integrated this into the community. We've, we've uh, shown a lot of impact. We'll show you some of this. And this got attention nationally. So we've been at this for a while. 
is about five years of research and then five years of starting this pilot. Just shortly after 2011, we started the pilot in 2012. And as of this year, it's now been accepted as a provincial program that's going to be rolled out across the province from one end to the other over the next two years. And essentially, from an outcome perspective, when we look at waits, so patient accessibility, we've turned what is usually a six to 12 month period of waiting to see somebody who's going to specially, specially assess your back to less than 12 days or 14 days. So we got a two week wait to see a community-based provider who's been trained by me and other specialists, so they're not me per se, but most of you don't actually need to see me because one, you don't want a surgery, you don't need a surgery, but you need to see somebody who's gonna assess you in an evidence-based way to assess what the issue really is. And if you do need a specialist, we've guaranteed that we would see that person within six weeks. So we've taken down all the barriers, started from the bottom, which is basically where we should be, is at the patient level, and built the, the infrastructure necessary to support the family doctor, to support you, to support yourself. So a lot of this is self-management. And then when you do need the care, it's actually available in a timely manner. And that's actually shown the, the Ministry of Health that we can actually do this differently with the resources we have. It's just re-engineering it in a way that's actually useful and central to your needs. Um, patient satisfaction has been through the roof, imagine. And, these folks are being seen by Physio Cairo in their communities. So they don't have to travel three hours to get here or pay $50 to park, spend two hours trying to find parking, um, and then see somebody who says, I can't help you, which is a surgeon. You're spending an hour with somebody who's been trained to really go through the details of your condition. And that doesn't cost you anything, and it's in your community. They communicate with your family doctor, they have a strong relationship. So our satisfactions have been through the roof. We didn't believe our first year results, so they kept on running the pilot until they were convinced four years later that their results are extremely consistent. Um, outcomes have been great. This is just mostly self-management. Um, and then also we've reduced unnecessary MRIs, specialist visits, eMERGE visits. So the model is actually paying for itself. The ministry's first model that's given them a return on their, on their investment. So they're making some money back by not paying for a whole bunch of stuff that they didn't need to pay for by providing the person the right care. Why do you need to see me if you're getting better and if you're getting the management that you actually need? So, and the providers, myself included, are much happier because we're having a conversation of, okay, we're helping you, not I can't help you go away. That doesn't help you in the end of the day. So it's really changing the paradigm of how we treat folks. So I'll speed up because I, don't want, I want to leave time for questions, but that's one of the more fundamental things as to we have a system now whereby if you have an early arthritic condition that we pick up that's not responding. Most of it is lifestyle activity change, things like that, but most of the people here have gone through that and it doesn't work. You need more intensive care, but if you find somebody who's early, we can then identify that person in the community and get them to a place like this for an injection when, when and if it's available in the future so we can actually do something at the right time rather than waiting until your joint's completely destroyed and we can't do anything about it other than a joint replacement. So we're taking this approach, we're doing it uh, across the different body parts uh, in our Center for Health Transformation. So we're providing the groundbreaking research to allow the ministry to show that we can do this for other joints. We're doing that in the shoulder at the moment, the hip and knees are already happening out, out into the province as well. And it's the shoulder parts being led by Dr. Bayat. Um, so our goals are really to improve your experience, improve the health of the population as a whole with arthritis, but also we need to have a sustainable healthcare system. We have a great healthcare system when it's used properly and we wanna maintain that. And we wanna protect it as a part of the system as much as, as you as a user of the system uh, should also do. So the no more guessing part, and I'll finish up with this. The other thing we're bringing into this is more personalized medicine. So right now, everybody with arthritis gets a one size fits all. Here's a pill, see what happens, come back and see me in six weeks. Okay, didn't work. Okay, go see this therapist, come back and see me in six weeks. It's that same back and forth. Right now in the Isaac program and others, we stratify folks. So if you're high risk, the pill may be the worst thing for you to do or an exercise for you to do. So we can figure out different groups of folks who need different care. But we wanna get it to the point where it's now about you. What's your specific need versus 
his specific need are going to be actually very different. And it's, it's a variety of things that bring that factor in, and that's where we need to go. So one of the things we're building is what's called the clinical decision support system. So this is where the, the nerdy side of me comes in, in the sense of the research, bringing in technology, using computer-assisted um, processes where we get patient information that goes through what's called machine learning, so it's these predictive algorithms that can take different factors from your information, including potentially your blood, and say, okay, here's your risk factor for a certain intervention. So if you're considering spine surgery, generally speaking, 70 to 80% of patients respond well. That means some don't, but right now we don't have the tools to figure out who's gonna respond predictably and who's not. So if I tell you your outcome from a surgery is likely going to be successful, and I give you a 90% success rate, but I give you a 20% success rate, what are you going to say? No thanks, <laughs> as you should. <laughs> Sometimes you're desperate, and you might think about it, but I would be saying no. So it helps you become truly a partner in your own health, to make decisions based on your personal information so that you can actually be part of that process. It's unfortunate that we can't fix everybody, but that's the reality. And if we just, if you think about it, that means 80, 20% of people having a knee replacement don't get benefit. That's a lot of people. That's the other way of looking at it. The 80% sounds great, but that means 20% don't actually get better. And we do over 100,000 of them a year in this country, and you do uh, hips and knees. And in the US, there's over 700,000 knee replacements a year. So when you do 20% of that, there's a lot of folks who are having a very expensive resource intense operation that are not actually getting benefit. So this is really where we want to go to, to allow people, it doesn't mean you don't need treatment, but you're, not, you're going to avoid a, a risky, potentially dangerous operation if it's not going to help you and we can be more, act, more predictive in that is a huge step forward. So our vision again, no more waiting, no more guessing and ultimately with Mohit's help, no more arthritis. That's, that's where we want to be, because we don't want this, <laughs> okay? I want to see all of you a lot, <laughs> and we don't want to end up in, no, nobody wants to lose their independence. So this is the end state of arthritis that we just, as graphic as it is, I want to really get my message across that we don't want that, we want this. Mobility for life, we've got to keep everybody moving, we're living longer, and we got to keep we got to keep you mobile. That's that's really what we want to accomplish at the end of the day. So thank you so much for listening, and uh, we'll open it up for questions. Wow, that was great. Thank you both. And why don't you stay up here yeah, if that's okay? And um, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. Just um, uh, and we can we have some time for some question and answers. And I know um, Dr. Rampersad has a, a hard stop, so I'm just going to keep time, uh, my eye on the time to make sure we can get him where he needs to go. <laughs> um, so let's just open the floor for questions. We have some microphones here, so put up your hand, and we'll come by uh, with the microphone. Here. Okay. Hi, um, your uh, description of the uh, process that a patient goes through, uh, go see the doctor, um, some kind of uh, discussion, go see somebody else, some kind of discussion. Um, I've, I've got early uh, osteoarthritis and um, I went to see someone and he said, well, um, there's nothing and it's just a pain relief. Well, I don't have pain, so there's nothing. And it was two or three years ago, and still there's nothing. And I'm, I'm not even sure if um, all doctors know about this. Uh, what, uh, and since I'm probably representative of a lot of people here, as, as you pointed out, what would you advise us to do when we see the um, arthritis specialist? Because we, as you said, most of us do know about lifestyle, exercise, sleep, et cetera, et cetera. We know all of that. Um, Mediterranean diet, all of it, but it's not necessarily going to help the uh, um, continuation of the degenerative process. Understood. That's a great question. Um, so what we're trying to do, you're right, most people don't know about this, and certainly as, as Dr. Kapoor uh, noted, the discovery of an injectable uh, molecule, which has you know, been the holy grail for decades, 
um, is still hopefully, you know, at the best three to five years out where we can actually start trialing, the, even, even just doing it as a trial in individuals. But, so that being said, um, what we're trying to do in the interim though is these integrated interprofessional models are truly reaching out and integrating primary care. So what's traditionally happened in our healthcare system is there's significant silos. Primary care, allied health, physios, chiros, etc., massage therapists in the community, and specialists. Guess what? None of us talk to each other on any kind of regular basis other than through you. So we end up asking you all the same questions again, etc., when you do see somebody. So part of the process is integration of that and using information technology, etc., to start networking and enable an individual to have a care plan that's visible to all your providers and, and more under your control so that some of the innovation that we're trying to put out there such that when we see that and uh, um, through th processes from the ministry as well as Health, Health Quality Ontario, building the, the what we call knowledge translation and exchange networks so that your provider does know that. So it's much more um, uh, available to them because of, we're changing how they practice. So they know now they have an easy way of getting this information, an easy way to send you to somebody who can actually spend time talking about what the options are rather than in a family physician's waiting room who's got 50 more people to see that data sort of say, okay, I, and they're not musculoskeletal specialists. So one thing about your family doctor, they've had about two weeks max of musculoskeletal training in their medical school. That's it. Many years ago. Hmm? And, and <laughs> right, very excellent point. And that, and that was also many years ago. So, I mean, I started out this very top down as many specialists do saying, oh, they don't know this, that, they should just read something. Well, that's actually not how it works. Um, they can't know what I've taken 20 years to know. It's just impossible. So you have to provide the supporting mechanism to allow them. So part of our focus groups wasn't just with patients, it was with family doctors to say, how can I change the system to actually help you do exactly what you would like them to do, which is uh, avail you to better knowledge and hopefully the ministry is now providing the resources to see an interprofessional uh, per person who works under my sort of umbrella to, to make sure that individuals are being educated in a way that it's more useful for them. But if we don't have something that can prevent your problem yet, uh, we can't fix that part <laughs> other than providing education and going forward. You're shaking your head, so I want to know. No, because right now there is nothing. That, that's the, that's what we're trying. That's why we're here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, but most ninety percent of folks don't need what we're trying to build. Majority of folks, if we do this right and early enough, can actually manage their symptoms. Certainly for back pain and for much early knee arthritis, is picking up early uh, alterations in your mechanics, in your muscles, et cetera. Those are the things that can actually be preventative, but we don't focus on preventative medicine in this country as a whole. We focus on reactive medicine where you have a problem and then we try to fix it. And that's, that's what we're trying to change. So it's, it's, a, it's a long process. So I'm not saying this is perfect, but we have to do, we've been doing it this way for 50 years and it hasn't worked. So we do need to try something, something different, albeit not perfect at this stage. Starting in, 2000, so. <laughs> Starting in 2000, and at that time we thought it can rejuvenate body parts, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, frequent, uh, currently it's not as frequently, uh, it may be quietly in the lab, but we don't hear as much about it. And um, could it be used to regenerate uh, cartilage? and not run away with itself and have cartilage, cartilage, cartilage? Is there some way? It's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. And I'll, and I'll say, uh, say to you, when, whenever there's something like a new technology which comes up, it actually gathers a lot of attention. And the research, you know, you've got to have a lot of uh, um, uh, patience because uh, um, you discover something 
but you don't know what that discovery actually really means. These cells were actually called as uh, regenerate almost every organ possible in our body, but that's actually not true. And that is especially not true for our joints. We cannot regenerate the entire cartilage in our joints, but we can at least stop at a certain stage so that it actually does not de uh, degenerate further. The problem is, right now, we have discovered these three specific uh, uh, technologies which we are using and we are, and these technologies are working. But to be able to get these technologies approved by Health Canada, by FDA, you have to show this in a very large, large subset of patients, prove those in large subset of patients, and then take to uh, a regulatory agency to be able to approve these. So, Something like stem cell, you know, there's a lot of trials which are going on. Some have been successful, some have not been successful, and some have been unsuccessful. The reason why they were not doing the adequate amount of patients which were required to do those trials. And those reasons were the reasons behind stopping those trials, and then somebody was not going to, even those technologies were good, nobody touched those technologies because once it's out of the clinical trial, you're always like, you have to serve caution that no, we can't actually use this technology. Doesn't mean that these technologies did not work. On the other hand, those technologies which have worked actually required more time to be able to build the, you know, the data. Right now, the, the molecular therapy we are working on, you know, would take minimum three to five years before we could actually take this to our first set of patients who actually will get it. It's, it's so hard to be able to, you, you can come up with the technology, but you have to prove it multiple times, and you have to really understand it's not going to have a side effect to be able to kill people, so, yeah, so. Most, to add that, most drugs take 15 years to get from the lab of discovery into a patient, so it's a very long cycle that happens. The, uh, you, I understand from your presentation that the, the, the ISEC, I may be pronouncing it incorrectly, for hips and knees has already been rolled out? So it's rolling out concurrently, so it's more focused on, right now the current system for hips and knees has been around for quite a while, but it's more specifically for hip and knee replacement. But now they've seen this model where we're treating the majority of folks who don't need surgery, so they're starting to open up that assessment process for also individuals who have arthritis but are not quite ready for joint replacement or a little earlier on in the, in the process. So that's over the next two years as well as the back program will be rolled out. How do you get access to that? That'll be through each Lynn is doing it uh, and then typically through the family physician. So it's, um, the implementation is going to start um, probably we've been meeting literally for the last six months with each Lynn figuring out where, when, and how, but it's, it's starting in, in um, uh, the Champlain, Lynn, so Ottawa area first. Uh, there's small centers already happening here. Um, so by March, they're hoping to have the process being started in most of the Lynn's, but it's gonna take a year before they're fully operational. One of the biggest problems I've seen, or I've seen with GPs, is they do a lot of guessing. They do not have the they do not have the right, the, the knowledge or the time to understand all the different aspects. So when you go there, and in my case, I had two years ago started to have hip problems with in my leg and my groin. Two years later, after seeing many many physiotherapists and everybody guessing, uh, I now need a hip replacement, um, which has taken a year to waiting to get it done. Right. My question there is that will doctors, GPs ever be in a position to understand everything or is AI, artificial intelligence, where stuff can be inputted and computers can figure out the possibilities of A, B or C happening and you can be directed and short circuit many, many years and save billions of dollars in finding the right treatment and not wasting time on the wrong treatment? Great point. Um, that's exactly where what we're currently doing, not with the AI yet. So the computer isn't doing it yet, but I am, and others like me. So we're having, um, as I said, one of the parts of this provincial in, in, uh, implementation is to allow that middle part where we can risk stratify somebody. So in your case, 
with these specific questions, primary care doctors are now using more and more risk tools. But we're, we're creating, if you have a risk tool, but you don't have a mechanism to get the person to the right care, then it's almost useless. So there are all these things actually exist in, in fragmented pieces, but what we've finally been able to do is actually put them together and two, get the support of the Ministry of Health and other stakeholders to play in the same sandbox and actually do what's best for the patient rather than what's best for each individual provider group. So that's, that's been a big change. There's all politics, et cetera, but at the end of the day, that's exactly what we're hoping to do. And that in and of itself is what's already saving money. And they've seen that even at a small scale, never mind to that point of getting somebody to the right who does actually need an operation instead of waiting three years when it's going to be less effective, they, they should have that opportunity to have that discussion much sooner and vice versa. Those who don't need an operation shouldn't be getting one either. So it's, it'll save significant impact on that patient as well as the system on both sides. And we are currently working on uh, uh, building an artificial intelligence, but it's called arthritis intelligence, <laughs> where you are. <laughs> actually, it was part of the tool which was actually showed yep. by uh, Raj. Uh, the, 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 the idea is to be able to uh, integrate almost every kind of uh, uh, data which we can capture from patients, but also the lab data, the blood tests which I talked to you about are going to be integrated into that and then you come up with this decision-making tool. So those are being implemented. And like I said, things, you know, things were done in a very different fashion before. We really tried to uh, you know, uh, sort of configure the, uh, the system in such a way that we could actually really put all these uh, pieces in place where everything which you capture from the, the patient data as well as the lab data can actually start talking to each other and actually uh, really tell us these uh, predictive tools or predictions of what success rate you have to be able to either undergo surgery or no surgery or also the uh, right kind of treatments you need as well. So. Our ultimate vision is to actually have this happen from your home. You can start the process. Most of it is your self-reported questions. And with current technology, there's no reason that some of this process can't actually happen from, from that thing. So we're trying to put it into the, certainly the family physician's hands, but also your hands to, to allow us to, to identify folks up, up front who are at high risk. Okay, I'm going to have to stop uh, to make sure that Dr. Rampersad um, makes it to his next uh, appointment. I just uh, I want to thank both of them for, for being here today and putting everything um, in the words that we can all understand. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, they will be... Um, I have a question to ask Dr. Ram Prasad. Dr. Mohit Kapoor will stay for some questions. Okay. Um, so I know uh, Dr. Ram Prasad does have to leave. So this I'm sorry. question specifically for Dr. Ram Prasad. Okay. Uh, Dr. Br <laughs> I say AAC. I as AAC. Are there, is there information available about where my wife can go to a center yeah. right, now right to now get access you, to it. Right. Yes, there is. It's on the it's on the web, and there's a website, Isaac.org, and um, but it's also through the ministry. And if your family doctor is part of the network, then you can go to it if you're in the Toronto area now. But over the next year, it'll be available more broadly. We would like to do it now. If it's not there, if she's not there, then who do we go to? Is there any other place we can go to? I can't fix everything at once. I'm no, sorry. okay. <laughs> no, no. So, I'm, I, sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to close it down now. Okay. But I just, you know, I do want to say thank you to all of you once again, because none of this would be possible without donor support. And I know many of you are loyal, long-time supporters. So I just, I, you know, I, I want to make sure that you all understand that you all make this possible. So thank you. I'm so glad you can come. I hope you can come out in the spring uh, to our next lecture and uh, stay posted and tuned to our Report on Your Support newsletter where we'll have the information about the next lecture. So thank you all for coming today. Thanks. Thank you.